Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here as people start to filter in. Welcome to today's panel, which is on coordinating research data support services across campus. My name is Dylan Riediger. I'm a program manager at Ithaca SNR. And with me today are Laura Hibbler, who is the uh, Associate University Librarian for Research and Instruction at Brandeis University, and Renee Barger, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor of the Health Science Library System at the University of Pittsburgh. It had been our hope today to have two other co uh, colleagues join us at the table, uh, Scott Walter, the Dean of the University Library at San Diego State, and Jen Green from the University of Chicago. Um, both of them have had excused absences come up in the uh, last 48 hours or so and send their regrets. We're going to spend most of our time today in conversation, but just to kind of frame what we'll be talking about. Um, as probably most people in this room know, research data services have become pretty foundational components of the research infrastructure and enterprise across disciplines. But at many institutions, they've developed in a very ad hoc fashion over the last 20 years or so. Um, or else there are uh, other institutions that are just beginning to build these kind of services out, um, who, are, who are trying to understand how to do so in a more intentional way than the last generation of services developed. As the demand for these kind of services increases, um, and as research, data intensive research becomes more complex, and as funders, uh, notably federal agencies, um, raise the bar for what counts as viable data management uh, and curation across the research life cycle, universities are recognizing the importance of a more coordinated approach to research data support services. Um, this, I think, will become even more important in the coming years, particularly once the uh, OSTP requirements for preservation of research data that is not associated with publications uh, starts to uh, become a reality, which I think is going to happen relatively soon based on what we're seeing out of the agencies so far. Libraries have uh, been major providers of these services on many campuses, and often we m want to remain so. But as the demands of supporting the labor behind data management and curation uh, grows, the need to be deliberate about how to share this burden across units is, is quite acute. To help uh, intervene in this area, Ithaca SNR has put together two cohorts of our research data support service project. Um, this is a two-year project that involves research and then working with our partners to implement a coordinated data support service strategy across their campus. Um, the cohorts, which are just beginning their work, are quite internally diverse. Um, they range from major global research universities um, to a number of R1s and R2s who are really trying to aggressively build their profile as research institutions, but what binds them together is a determination to find ways to work across campus units and silos to uh, take a crack at, if not solving, at least mitigating the challenges of supporting researchers. So today we're going to talk a little bit about opportunities and challenges in this space. Um, and we're going to do this as a roundtable conversation. We're, we're no prepared remarks. We're going to be not quite winging this, but fairly close. Um, and I'm going to start by offering some questions to Renee and to Laura. And we'll leave quite a bit of time, I think, for questions from you. So my first question, I'll pose this to both of you. Um, coordinating support services across campuses requires a lot of units to uh, play ball together and be, and be nice um, and to be willing to work together. Some of the units that we're often seeing in the cohort are the Vice Provost for Research, IT, various research centers, high performance computing centers, and a whole other kind of constellations of units depending on the configuration of a particular institution. What do you see as the role that your library or your library system can play in facilitating the cooperation that's required to make a campus-wide initiative of, like this work? Uh, so to contextualize my response, I just want to provide a little bit more information about Brandeis. Um, Brandeis 
is one of the smallest R1s, and we have about 3,600 undergrads, 2,000 grad students, 600 faculty, uh, and we don't have a medical school, but we have graduate programs in arts and sciences, business, and public policy. Uh, and for a school of our size, we have a relatively large number of academic programs and departments. Uh, and I think also a related con piece of context for Brandeis is that we were a merged library and IT organization um, until about 2016. So I think that just is helpful as I move into the answering the question. Uh, so I see the library's role as a connector and translator between different campus units as we do look to coordinate research data services. For example, the library can bring a deeper understanding of the data service needs of different PIs, uh, around their needs around uh, storage, for instance, to our conversations with uh, an IT department. Uh, and an IT department often takes a different approach to technology and infrastructure needs than we might in the library. Uh, but I think we in the library really understand the, both the pressures that an IT department is facing when it comes to maintaining stable systems, uh, but we're, we also understand those research pressures and the administrative workloads of researchers and faculty and PIs. Um, so we can really translate between those two groups and be advocates on campus for that more centralized approach to research data services that I think is so needed. Um, and we, by being those translators, we can take into account all of those needs and pressures. Uh, and I think also it's worth noting too that the library can be a connector of individual people even on a, a good sized campus. Uh, for example, we found that researchers don't necessarily want to share their data, their successful data management plan by posting it somewhere that everyone on campus can see it. But if someone like a librarian who they know asks, uh, would it be all right with you if we share this plan that you had that was successful with someone who's doing a data management plan for the first time, uh, there's often that willingness. So I think there's that willingness to help even if the two researchers don't know each other. In the library, we can be that connection between individual people. And I think that really just builds on so many years of great work being done by libraries and supporting researchers and building on those connections. So going forward, I think that library historic and continuing strength in connecting people will be immensely helpful in coordinating research data support services. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm representing the uh, University of Pittsburgh Health Sciences Library System. Our university is a large R1 institution um, in the top 10 of NIH funding. And uh, just to preface a little bit, our libraries are administratively separate. So our health sciences um, library, I report directly to the senior vice chancellor for the health sciences, and we have a university library system that reports up through the provost. So um, we do have roles in breaking down silos of both what we call lower campus and upper campus health sciences. Um, but like Laura, one of the major advantages I see our libraries playing a role is as collaborators and connectors. We work with faculty, researchers, postdocs, and students in all the schools and all the departments. And so we offer our unique expertise to organize, share, and cite data. But we also see a relatively holistic view of challenges that researchers encounter throughout the research data life cycle. If something is outside our areas of expertise, as libraries, we leverage our contacts to point researchers in the right direction. So I see the library as being key in identifying partners across campus who are offering research data support services key in informing researchers of these existing services at their point of need, and also key in helping to compile a roadmap of these services. Renee, if I could just ask a follow-up question to that. How active is your library right now at providing support services to researchers? What kind of services do you offer? Can you tell us a little bit about what the status quo looks like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so uh, we are relatively active, especially uh, with the NIH uh, funding or mandate to have a da data management and sharing plan. Um, we do mostly consultation and education um, across the health sciences. 
We also have a really good relationship with the data services team at the university library system. So we collaborate um, across campus to address common needs, offer workshops, offer symposiums or webinars on data and data management practices. Yeah. Laura, is that a pretty decent description of the role of libraries at Brandeis as well? Sure, so far our most popular data services that are offered are our workshops and consultations around data analysis and software, and we're beginning to see more interest in data management plan support. Uh, we've offered that for a long time, we just haven't necessarily seen a huge uptick, a, a huge use of that, uh, but we are really excited to offer more in that area going forward. And I will say the folks who have been providing the data consultation and workshop series, uh, they've just continuously been really great about adapting what they're offering based on the changes in the software people want to use um, and going forward um, as far as the increased support for data management plans as well. Great. Um, I think some of the things that I'm, I'm taking from both of your responses to this question is um, the idea that the library has quite a bit of expertise that it can leverage um, and a, a fairly unique institutional setting in that it is collaborating with other units but also has ties to researchers um, that many other units may not share. Um, in the, Having just spent a few minutes talking about things that the library is really well positioned to do, um, what are some things that you feel like you need somebody else to help you with? What, what are the areas where libraries' ability to act in this space are, are most constrained? Uh, so in libraries, I think we have a tendency to fill in gaps in services and resources on campus. Uh, and we're often really successful in filling in those gaps. Um, so successful, in fact, that other campus units, I think, often rely on us to fill in those gaps. Uh, so here, though, I think, um, and I'm, I'm sure others would say the same, libraries really need support um, and resources from campus units like the provost office and IT, particularly with regards to uh, storage needs um, as, we, <laughs> as we look to develop uh, research data services. And we also need that collaboration from offices and research administration and pre-award staff. And I think another area that um, we sometimes need to work on in libraries, I think, is sometimes just being prepared not to say yes to everything that um, is asked of us or to really advocate in some cases for <laughs> additional research data services um, without getting that additional support that's needed. So besides data, where would you most like to be prepared to say no? Uh, well, I very explicitly said, um, be prepared not to always say yes, as opposed to saying no. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think storage is the, the, the major one. one that we you know, can't just spin things up overnight, um, that we really need resources and services, and that um, even with all the financial resources, that collaboration with uh, campus partners as well. And I'll add to Laura, um, and based on some of the grassroots committees that I've sat on to start to identify and coordinate research data services, one of the biggest challenges is oversight and ownership of the effort. Libraries alone and even small interested groups cannot advance effort at an institutional wide level. We cannot incentivize researchers to share best practices or uh, incentivize them for good data management practices or financially support coordination, storage, platforms, or additional staffing. To truly have an institutional focus, we need support from the highest levels of leadership. And um, along these lines, a data science task force was appointed at the University of Pittsburgh in 2019 by our provost. The task force was challenged with recommending a coordinated strategy to equip undergraduate and graduate students with knowledge and skills for increasing a data-oriented world, to develop and use data science methods in their research, and to attract and retain faculty who use data science associated methods in their disciplines. A representative from our health sciences library system was appointed to this task force along with representatives from the university library system, leaders from IT, leaders from research computing, the office of research, and various schools with data in their curricula. One of the top recommendations from the task force 
was to create an organizational structure and appoint a leader. As a result, an associate vice Pro provost for data science was created and the position was filled in January of this year. Those are some, some really interesting um, observations about the importance of oversight and governance. Um, is this new position also going to be involved in funding um, any of the, the research data services? I'm wondering if either of this is a question, I guess, for both of you. If we start to try to reimagine where some of these services sit institutionally, many of them are going to be serving uh, researchers who cut across uh, disciplinary boundaries, colleges, um, different kinds of units. How, how do you create a funding structure that reflects um, the diversity of interests and communities who might be intersecting with these things? And I, I recognize that's probably a hard question. Mm. Yes, I, I uh, think that's a difficult question to answer. Do you have thoughts, Laura? Uh, I guess I would just say that uh, I, I think a lot remains to be seen. And uh, one thing that we are talking at uh, many levels at our campus is uh, talking about how to fund things that fall across many uh, schools and programs. Uh, because I think there is that recognized need that some of these services need to be centralized and supported centrally. Yeah. In our planning call for this, um, for this panel, one of the things that we talked about was um, the, the finding that, that SNR often finds when we interview researchers, which is that they feel like they get the most value out of one-on-one -on -one consultative, uh, long-term, or at least intensive um, exposure to expertise around their data needs. This is a very difficult thing to scale, um, given the realities of staffing and funding needs. And yet it seems to be what a lot of people are asking for. Absent some kind of magical bucket of money that's going to allow you to hire you know, staff at, at a scale to accommodate this, what kind of things do you see researchers as uh, needing to develop their own competencies in over the coming years? I just want to add a comment, uh, Dylan, about just the, the landscape and the need for consultation. Um, I mean, we're finding there's a lot of education out there, um, but what they really do need is that consultation at their point of need. And um, one of the things that we're trying to work towards under the new Associate Vice Chancellor is um, communities of practice to help sort of leverage the expertise across campus in a somewhat non-financially strapped way. Um, how that plays out is, is to be seen, obviously, but um, it, it's, it's something that it's happening. We have various levels of expertise, um, but without the funding to actually support consultation services, mm -hmm. finding other ways to make that happen. So are you acting as kind of a convener and a provider of space for those kind of communities of practice, or do you envision that being how you would fit within that? Yes, I do envision that, um, that we would definitely be convener, be able to op offer space for those services. Uh, I guess what I would add is um, certainly sustainability and scalability is a challenge, uh, but f finding ways to make it more sustainable, uh, you know, we offer a lot of these things within the library, but if we um, working with other campus units where we know there is that need for developing additional skills to, uh, you know, embed training in existing training that they already have there to meet, for instance, uh, with the, almost all of the graduate students um, uh, and provide additional training there. Another area, too, I'll add is uh, we're, we're seeing increased need for programming skills. Um, and again, there's lots of education, but it's that one-on-one, -on -one, this is my project, can you help me? I'm stuck with, um, especially R and Python, we do uh, genomics data uh, in, in our library through our molecular biology information service. And so we're, we're challenged with that gap right now and 
whose role is it to support that and what a sustainable model might look like. So I'm curious to, hoping to hear some uh, insights. Yeah. Laura, you kind of kicked us off by talking about the idea of the library as, as a unit that could connect across institutional silos. Um, and, and I want to kind of follow up on that thread a little bit um, because I think most of us who spend our time in or around universities are pretty familiar with those silos. Um, what is it? As, as Brandeis was making the decision to participate in this project, can you talk through the process a little bit of how you initially created a like kind of coalition of, of the willing and, and where you went to turn to find partners and, and how that kind of evolved? Sure, uh, so the, the Brandeis team for the Ithaca Coordinating Data Services Study includes uh, uh, myself as well as two of our data analysis specialists in the library and then we, um, as, as is request, or recommended as part of the project, we also have um, a person who's part of a research center in one of our graduate schools. Uh, and uh, we, but we also talked to um, our Office of Research Administration about recommendations for who to involve. Uh, and really want to make sure that at the later stages, even those people who aren't on the, the research team itself, that we're really involving them when it comes to interviewing people and providing updates on the study. And um, the, our team member who's from outside of the library, um, when we first met, I actually thought she had a really interesting perspective on uh, our, our campus and the, the potential impact of a project like this. Uh, she was really saying, since we are, as I mentioned earlier, the smallest R, or one of the smallest R1s in a relatively small university, she really was excited because she felt like we have that potential um, to develop a stronger coordination off campus that might be a lot harder at a much larger university. Uh, I certainly, certainly share her excitement, but I also realize just how much work there is to be done as well. Uh, and I just think um, going forward our continued steps and trying to uh, build stronger connections even on a siloed campus, it really just comes back to those connections we talked about earlier, like connecting with a few of those siloed units who can then uh, help us connect with the even further siloed units. Um, and just one example from our recent work, um, we've really been working a lot with our pre-award team staff uh, on campus um, as the, uh, to prepare for the new NIH data management and sharing policy. Uh, and they've just been so helpful in that they really know what research grants are underway, who's going to need support, uh, and they just bring an in-depth understanding that's just really valuable. And also they, I think, speaking, going back to that idea of sustainability of our services, um, you know, we do those communications that go out really widely to, um, you know, everyone on campus or all faculty in a certain division. Uh, but by working with our pre-award staff, they're really able to also do some targeted messaging to people who need this information at that moment in time. Uh, so that's been really helpful. And I, uh, I think working with units like that around campus can help us then connect with other units that we haven't connected with as much. Yeah. Uh, Renee, a, a somewhat a similar question for you. You mentioned earlier this task force, and I imagine the task force will be involved um, in some way, shape, or form with the research team that you've put together. Can you, can you tell, tell us a little bit about the task force composition and maybe in particular how you're working across the bridge between uh, the College of Arts and Sciences and the Health Sciences? Um, is that a particularly significant divide at Pitt? And if so, what are you doing to kind of work across it? So um, actually the Ithaca project we're, we're using as a starting board, jumping board to um, continue our collaboration across campus. Um, one of the challenges that we do face as a health sciences library system is um, just by the organizational structure at the university, uh, many other players in the research data realm don't necessarily think of the health sciences library system. They're thinking more of the university library system. But um, our partnerships with the university library system, if we're not pulled in, they uh, 
at least reach out to us and let us know and we get ourselves pulled in or um, reach out to uh, be pulled in across the larger campus setting. Within the health sciences, um, we've been uh, coordinating and collaborating with our uh, health sciences CIO, um, our various uh, deans in, in the schools of the health sciences, our, we have a CTSI program that also does research and uh, data support that we partner with to offer joint programs, joint classes. Uh, we partnered with our Office of Sponsored Programs uh, to offer education under the NIH data sharing and management policy. And it's these partnerships that I think any way that we can partner across the university to offer our expertise in, in a way that is assisting them with some of the challenges they're having. It goes a long way into getting us recognized as a partner in the research data services space that leads to, as Laura mentioned, more collaborations, um, more uh, ways to connect, and more ways for us to be recognized. Yeah. As you kind of project yourself forward into the future. Um, how will you know if you've been successful? Like what is, what is a good way of thinking about what success might look like uh, in a, you know, the next two to five year time frame? What does that, what does that mean to coordinate services successfully? That's a great question and the first thing that comes to mind, although I'm sure there's a lot that could be added, would even be, and I know this is actually, it's probably on my mind because of the ongoing work with the Ithaca Project, but even just a comprehensive inventory of the data services on campus, uh, because I, I don't think that we're alone and not really having that um, currently. Uh, we sort of know who's doing what to some extent, but we're always surprised to hear about different services and supports elsewhere on campus. So I think even just having that inventory and knowing who to turn to will be a really important thing to have in the future. That was also on my list, uh, Laura. <laughs> um, but some other things uh, that I hope to gain, uh, especially working with the Ithaca cohort, is, is to think of metrics to measure that success. Um, a roadmap of services being, being one of those. Um, but also, how can we measure this increase in collaboration across the institution? It, can we measure an increase in citing of data sets? or an increase in reproducibility of data. Um, spending less time on ad hoc solutions and a coordinated effort. Another thing though that I would uh, personally like to see and learn from, from the project and from our efforts at the university is to see where support services are lacking and collaborate with our campus partners and our Associate Vice Chancellor for Data Science to determine the, scap excuse me, the staffing and the skill sets that are needed to fill gaps and have those conversations to see if the library has a role in filling those gaps. That's great, thank you. Um, just to, to push a little more on, on the metrics question, which I think is a, a really interesting one. and. Um, and also to say something about the inventory, this is a, an important part of the project that SNR will be doing. Um, we are in the process right now of putting together a national inventory of research data services at a pretty good sample of R1s, R2s, and liberal arts colleges, as well as Canadian Carl institutions. Um, with the idea being that we want to, to begin to understand the kind of landscape of where services are being offered, what kind of services are being offered where, um, and to give people the opportunity to see kind of a heat map of what is happening on uh, not only their campus, but across the landscape. And we've asked all the participants in the project to do this inventory on their own institution. Um, they're using a somewhat more detailed tool than we are in that, uh, Theirs provides them the opportunity to dig much more deeply into the personnel who are running these things and how to contact them, uh, staffing models, things like that. Um, and I know from talking to uh, VPRs in particular that this seems to be uh, a pretty ubiquitous answer from their office about uh, what they need to learn 
first is just where these things exist. Um, so that's kind of like one way of thinking about success, creating a, a level of uh, transparency or clarity uh, for the institution to be able to understand what it's doing. Um, presumably also for then researchers to be able to understand what's available to them. Um, if you think about more unit level ways of understanding success, like for the library, you know, maybe I'll ask you this question for starts, Laura, like how will, how will the library know whether they are being successful as in their part of this partnership? Uh, I think some of our, the methods that we've been using over the, the last few years will be helpful here, just uh, keeping metrics, uh, but really looking beyond just sort of quantitative tick marks of consultations and workshop attendance, um, also trying to gather where possible some of that qualitative feedback um, about what this service offered by the library allowed a researcher and a, or their team to do that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um, and I think that, that it would be really interesting to not just ask that uh, immediately after someone uh, uses a library service, but further down the road, closer to completion of the project. And I, this might be hard to capture, but I think it would be really useful to have data from um, researchers around campus about uh, not just what they were able to do, but um, maybe the time savings um, that, they, that they found in being able to work with uh, library uh, data services. Do you have anything to add to that, Renee? Um, I, I would add also uh, the qualitative, we do not do a lot of the showing of the qualitative data. So I, I like that as well as, as following up to talk to the researchers um, and get some of that qualitative data. Uh, again, though, uh, more quantitatively, that's something I would like to hopefully as, as a cohort think about what measures can, can we quantitatively identify? And um, as I said earlier, things like the uh, signing of data sets and the reproducibility of data. What kind of measures can we come up with that, that show evidence that the library had a role in that? Yeah. Uh, one, one final question and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the Q&A. Um, these kind of services are quite expensive um, in terms of staff capacity and other kinds of resources that are required to do them well. Um, are you imagining that this project is kind of cost neutral? Is the idea to offer the same number and type of service, but in a more centralized fashion? Are there cost savings potentially? Are there, is there gonna be a need to in, increase the amount of resources that you're devoting to data support? And if so, sh are those gonna be internal funds? Should federal agencies, other kinds of actors who are helping to fund the infrastructure for research be involved here? Like, what is your early sense of the financial implications of, of this project and of the, the goal that we're pursuing together? Um, I will say that uh, the goal is to really coordinate services, in my opinion, the hope is that it will not be a cost savings, but it will at least avoid duplication of effort. And so if we can align our services as a library against uh, the other services that are being offered across campus uh, in a way that is avoiding duplication of effort, but is also focusing on common goals and, and together collaborating to figure out what is missing, what needs to be improved upon. And then as far as financial resources go, um, I, I envision it as a, again, it's a, it's a university-wide effort that um, whether it comes down from chancellor, provost, um, to our internal budgets, depending on where it makes sense for those services to sit. I really like the way you phrased that, avoiding duplication of effort. So there's not necessarily cost savings, but by avoiding that duplication of effort, it hopefully is just helpful to everyone, especially given that 
it's, a lot remains to be seen, but it seems like in all likelihood there will be additional costs on universities as we are trying to uh, fulfill mandates to make data more openly available and just the storage needs that will be involved every step of the way. Great. Um, I'm going to turn things open uh, to Q&A now, and I will say that in addition to whatever questions you might have, um, because of the absences of two of our panelists, we've lost about half of the institutional diversity that we had hoped to put on display here. Um, so please feel free also to um, use the opportunity to make some comments to contribute to this conversation that may not be a direct question, but speak to how these issues are playing out uh, in your particular institutional context as well. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Kara Watley from Caltech, and Laura, I was uh, feeling a lot of this when you were talking, um, because we're also uh, a really small R1, and a lot of the things that you were talking about, um, we are also dealing with. And I, I mean, this is not like fully formed, I guess, but I'm just wondering, so the other, the other units on campus that are our partners in, you know, research data support services are perhaps even less well staffed than the library is, at least on my campus. And so there has been some, it's, it's not just thinking about like what we say yes to, um, but, but there's been sort of like, you know, uh, stepping back from the line. Um, with the library sort of being the only one who didn't step back yet, right? Um, and so I'm interested in a little bit of um, kind of exploring opportunities if we are going to grow these services, um, maybe growing support not in the library but in other units on campus, so like advocating for more people in research computing support, for example, or maybe even like shared positions or things like that. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, if you've been thinking um, about that at all given the, I guess, size similarities and that sort of thing, so thanks. Thanks. Uh, and I think, actually, I've been told at least that Caltech is the smallest R1. I think we're the second smallest. So, uh, uh, and um, I really appreciate what you said about, you know, the staffing challenges that IT has. Um, and uh, I think because it's easy at times to get frustrated uh, with the current state of things, but we do know our colleagues and that they're often struggling with the same uh, resource constraints. Uh, so at the risk of sounding like glowingly optimistic, I, one thing I really hope comes out of the, the coordinating data services project uh, with Ithaca is that um, not only can we avoid that duplication of services, but that by um, bringing, uh, talking with all of our partners across campus, we can have that coordinated um, advocacy too for the additional resources and um, not just that advocacy, but um, that under, shared understanding of um, places where those resources might be uh, best situated. Uh, so I know that's a little bit of a glowingly optimistic outlook, but I'm really hopeful um, and think there's a lot of potential with the way that the study is laid out. Thank you. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex from Papa Ithaca. Uh, the all caps Ithaca, not SNR, JSTOR. Um, I'm wondering, you're talking about, uh, I, I'm wondering whether or not you see opportunities for collaboration across institutions. Obviously, you're doing that within Ithaca, within this SNR cohort, but I'm wondering if um, there are opportunities, services that either exist already or that might, that might provide support for uh, organizations like yourself to, um, to, to be more efficient or anything like that? That's a, a really good question. Um, at this point, we are not, but um, it, just because we are trying to figure it out at our own institution, uh, but I, I, I can definitely see that. At, at, um, we have a lot of strong 
institutions around the Pittsburgh area that would, would make natural collaborators for us, um, especially in, in space. Uh, we have the Carnegie Mellon University that's very close to us. And, and we do have faculty that are sharing different roles, dual appointments. Um, so I, I, I do envision that perhaps that might be a, or a way that we can go as we figure it out first in, within our own institution. And I'd say we're still figuring a lot out um, at our own institution at Brandeis as well. Uh, but I think there's um, certainly already that knowledge sharing between institutions um, in, the, in the consortia we belong to, um, as well as um, I mentioned the meetings we've been having with our pre-award staff, and they're part of some uh, collaborations with other institutions around things. Uh, like templates for new data management plans that uh, were new to us and or that are very newly developed that um, I, they really felt very strongly were going to be helpful for researchers at Brandeis. So uh, I, I think there's definitely a lot of potential there. And, and I wish that Scott were here because I know he was going to talk a lot about um, uh, some uh, cross-institutional collaboration within the Cal State system. Yeah. I was just going to mention that. Um, this is where Scott would have been really useful. Um, other questions? Comments? Hi, Judith Conklin, Library of Congress. You mentioned um, storage at one point, and in this um, ever-growing data-driven society and institutions, are you ever asked by your IT department for um, storage projections? And if so, how do you do that? I have not been asked for storage projections. Um, some of my colleagues from Brandeis are here who might be able to say if they have been asked for such information, but I will put them on the spot. Uh, but I think it's something to think about and really difficult to plan for a few years out as well. Yes, I, I agree. I, we have not been asked about storage predictions either, but definitely something that is important to consider, and I'm, I'm hoping it's on the minds of others in the institution or who are supporting our research supports. Just if, if I can just uh, add a comment to that, um, I've had some conversations with people who are operating generalist repositories recently. Um, so somewhat different scale than the institutional repositories that your question was directly about, but um, they're anticipating pretty substantial increases uh, even over the next 12 months in the volume of data that's being deposited. Um, and I. I think it's pretty reasonable as the full impact of the requirements to deposit data not associated with, with publications start to play themselves out. There's still a lot of uncertainty about what exactly that will mean, but I think it's pretty safe to say it will mean a pretty substantial increase in volume, um, even if we don't know what that, you know, what the exponent is yet. It's going to be quite large, so. Um, so I don't know that this is scalable, but I'll just answer that question because we have been asked that at Caltech. Um, and what we actually did, the library, was uh, we conducted a, a survey of all of the labs on campus to find out what data they have now. Um, you know, the stuff that's on the hard drives under their desk, that sort of thing. Um, and we're trying to use that to, to answer a few questions, including um, the, you know, the amount of storage that we're going to be asked for, but also try, trying to use that to answer questions about, like, research data security and risk and that sort of thing. Kara, is, 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 uh, is what you learned from that exercise uh, terrifying, reassuring, somewhere in between? I mean, for us, it's pretty terrifying. Um, <laughs> the, just the volume of data that we're really looking at that at this point we're really not prepared to, to deal with. On the other hand, it's like, you know, what's scarier, the monster that you don't know or the one that you do? Um, I think that it's given us some reassurance that at least we have some data points that we can plan around. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Marcel Fortin from the University of Toronto. And one of the areas that um, we've had success in, in getting uh, sort of more people working in RDM 
in research data management is um, we have a, a tri-campus committee, but we also have the two, two uh, librarians who are dedicated to RDM who have actually developed with the committee uh, a method of training, sort of a train the trainers, and so they've leveraged uh, li liaison librarians. So that com between that committee and the liaison librarians, um, that's worked really quite well in positioning the library, but also in, in getting people involved in the entire process. So I'm just wondering if uh, either of you or the other participants, if, if you've done something similar and, and if you had success in that. We haven't in data services done train the trainer uh, very much, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, other areas of the library do a lot of training of um, even students who then um, are able to train other uh, uh, students and researchers across campus, and it's really quite successful, so I think there's a lot of potential there. I also agree that there's a lot of potential there. Um, things that the library uh, could, we, we do have a data catalog that requires metadata and encourages um, researchers to deposit, uh, it's not a place to deposit their data, it's just to a, a placeholder to point to where their data might sit, whether that's in a repository or elsewhere. But um, there's opportunities for sure to be able to train others um, because if, if that's a way that researchers want to go to um, make their data accessible, uh, we wouldn't be able to sustain the amount of research and projects that would go into that catalog. So I can um, definitely see areas and opportunities to train um, grad students to, uh, or researchers to input their own metadata to associate in the record. But also all thinking about communities of practice it is, is a way to hopefully um, organically increase the um, expertise across different units. Mark Loberswiler, University of Oklahoma Libraries. Um, to answer your question, we don't know what's already in existence. We're talking a lot about the new creation of stuff. So the answer to your one question, we get a research group that's sitting at six and a half petabytes of storage. And that's not new. That's the archival thing. They anticipate another petabyte within the year. Um, my question is, is in regard to retention. Right, as we build our staffs and we try to bring in this expertise, there's also what incentives do we have, what advancement opportunities, not necessarily moving into management. In the libraries, it seems to be that's the common thread. You kind of work in the trenches and then you get to a managerial position. And there's the whole retention process when you've got expertise walking out the door and you're still trying to fill your holes and then new holes appear. That's a great question about uh, uh, staff and um, retention um, of the people who have these skills. And I think we're all seeing that it's hard to fill and retain staff in some cases. Uh, but I think um, certainly revisiting job descriptions and compensation if uh, a job has changed enough. And I think there also are some of those things on wor working on a college campus or university campus that um, are appealing that uh, perhaps people wouldn't have that opportunity to work, to uh, be involved in. Otherwise, for instance, one of our staff members who provides a lot of our really crucial data support services is teaching a full semester course and, you know, is just over the moon so excited about that. And um, certainly he could, uh, that it, like, that's just an opportunity that he has that I think um, is important to consider. And identifying those skill sets and, um, professional development opportunities for the staff that are currently doing to advance their skills as well is also something that is constantly um, on, on our minds. Uh, Mark Jordan, Simon Fraser University. Uh, in Canada, Canadian research universities were kind of forced to or compelled to develop uh, research data management strategies as part of the federal tri-agencies, the three main funders in Canada, the federal funders. And this was a great, I think a great strategy on the part of the tri-agencies because it really did, I, I'm only speaking from my experience at Simon Fraser University, not the experience at my peer universities. But it really forced us to, uh, the, the outcome of that process was a written 
research data management strategy that we needed to make public. But the, that was the end goal, but the, the journey to get to it was even more important and more valuable because it allowed us to better know our partners on campus and in the formulation of the strategy to clearly articulate or at least start to clearly articulate where, like who, who is responsible for what, what are the, you know, what are the, uh, what's the overlap, where can we improve efficiencies and improve service to researchers. So uh, I think we were fortunate to be forced to do that. Uh, yeah, and, and now we're moving into the operational phase. So the things that we identified as aspirational goals in our strategies, we're now, now that we've delivered the strategies, we're now moving into more of an operational phase to kind of get those things going. Thanks so much for mentioning that, actually, because we've been, at SNR, we've been following goings on in Canada uh, quite closely. Um, and I agree, they're, they're quite interesting. And it's, there, there's obviously some pretty significant differences in national contexts, um, but there are a lot of lessons that we can learn and that we've been trying to incorporate into the design of this project. Um, I will say that the second cohort, which is going to be meeting for the first time uh, next month, includes three Canadian institutions. Um, so we're going to have a, a kind of a little mini cohort of, of Canadian schools who are working through this kind of next phase of the process that you're describing. And I think it's gonna be quite exciting to get to see what, what that means for them. And one thing that I just wanted to comment on that um, uh, was uh, you mentioned the, how helpful it was to have that strategy that came out of that process, but just also how helpful the process itself was. And um, I think the same will be uh, the, true with the Ithaca Coordinating Data Services Project and that, you know, we're really in the very early stages, but already just that process of talking with campus colleagues has been helpful, just you know, hearing about not just um, challenges with storage, but challenges um, with storing encrypted data, uh, and also from our campus colleagues, uh, you know, despite our best efforts and um, the amount of outreach and promotion we do, uh, sometimes they're still just not available, they're not aware of some of the services that we provide that they would find really useful. So I think the process itself will be very, very helpful. Okay, uh, Karim Bogida, Stony Brook University. First, uh, thank you, Laura, Rene, and, and Dylan for, uh, and Ithaca in general for uh, doing this data service thing. And we're part of cohort two, so we're looking forward to working with all, with all of you. My question is uh, probably hard to answer. It's for Rene. Uh, you have a new AVP data science. So if this position, I, I believe it's part of the provost office, but if this position doesn't have staffing and budget, so it's basically a coordinator and influencer, how can you achieve that? I think it's a first step. Um, it, uh, the position sits um, under the provost and our associate vice chancellor for research. Um, so it's a first step based on uh, recommendations from the task force and from the growing uh, data uh, challenges across the university. Um, I, I don't say or can't say with any certainty that there's not plans for staffing and budget behind that. Because I agree with you. I think, I think there has to be. And um, the, the project here, too, uh, is perfect timing to be pulling that position in. He, he is part of our Ithaca project group. So um, I think the uh, things that we learn, especially in this first year, um, and as he's doing other fact finding across the university, that the project's going to help inform those decisions as well. Shima Wang from Northwestern University. Um, I want to circle back then about the question about funding model. Um, at the Northwestern, um, in response to this coming requirement mandate, university formed some approach 
myself as dean of library and CIO and uh, VPR, we become the executive sponsor group to kick off two working group on the data security, research data security, infrastructure policy service. So we're working on that. I try to put my arms around about if there is the funding model to be emerging from this exercise, I have a hard time to figure out, to articulate what we really need funding for. Is this for repository infrastructure, security, storage, or is this for the human labor on the library IT side or the VPR office side, or this is for something else? So my question to the panel is, have your institution discussed this kind of issue? Where you imagine the centralized funding distributed to roles and responsibility among the libraries, IT, and the VPR office, what that could look like? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, and again, that we're looking forward to uh, figuring that out, or at least coming up with a better uh, reflection of what that's going to look like. But um, we, from conversations that I ha have had and what I'm seeing, uh, definitely I see funding needed or money needed to support the data storage. And um, also, as far as staffing goes, um, again, I'm hoping to identify those gaps uh, to work across campus to find out what needs are not being met um, as these policies roll out and more and more data requirements, uh, data sharing requirements are, are needed. Uh, what exactly does that look like? Um, and I think it's too soon for us to be able to say that. But again, with this project and these collaborations, that's something that we're hopeful we'll have a better handle on. Um, but also thinking about yeah, what skills are needed um, for people. I think there, there probably will be some things that come out that there are skills that are needed to meet some of these demands. But I can't say or speak to what that might be at this point. I would agree with what Renee said, especially, um, you know, I think even in the next, uh, not to kick the can down the road, but um, even in the next few months, we're going to be seeing um, what type of feedback um, is provided on some of these early data management plans that have been submitted since the new NIH data management and sharing policy went into effect. Um, you know, what type of additional support do PIs need, that type of thing. So I think once we begin to see um, how uh, new mandates are impacting the research needs, um, I think we'll be better positioned to figure out uh, exactly where the funding should go as far as uh, storage and staffing and training. You all thought you had ducked the question the first time I asked it. Um, <laughs> not so. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, um, Todd Grappone, I'm Associate University Librarian at UCLA. and we just concluded a two-year-long research data uh, infrastructure, research data and infrastructure plan. Uh, Shimo, it's about $75 million, I think we're talking about, just to get started. Um, like Pitt, UCLA has a health center on campus, and so it is, you know, we're trying to be comprehensive. And I, I just wondered, um, uh, you know, fundings of, I mean, it seems like a lot of money, but UCLA is a $1.7 billion research enterprise. And, you know, in context, it's, it's not really. Um, I don't think. That's my argument anyway. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have had conversations on campus about um, uh, funding data services through um, uh, larger grants, research funding, indirects, that sort of thing. Thanks. That's actually a, a very 
interesting question. Um, we, from the library perspective, have not talked about that. Um, we've talked about uh, inserting funding uh, for open access and for thinking about how to deposit data, but not for uh, actually the services. So that's actually a very interesting question. Are, are you, have that, has that come up at UCLA? Yeah, I mean, because it, it's logical. If you think about it, we, we insert ourselves in grants for services such as systematic reviews or uh, uh, the clinical care guidelines that are being published through larger grants that we naturally insert ourselves in and, uh, and provide the financial resources as part of that grant to support that. So that's actually a really good idea. We are out of time. Uh, thanks so much, Laura and Renee. Um, and also thanks to all of you. Those were a, a very good set of questions. Um, so thanks for coming. And we, as SNR will be providing updates about this project as it develops. As usual, we'll be sharing what we are learning with the community at intervals throughout. So we look forward to continuing this conversation.